Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Hollywood Breaks. It's good to be with you on this Friday morning. As you can see, we have the usual Keith Rao, the founder of Vision Craft Brew and our Hollywood insider joining us. And yet another piece of Keith's amazing collection of friends. <laughs> Jeremy is now joining us, too. Uh, it's good to have you guys with us today. Keith, introduce your friend to us. I'm glad to. Uh, good to be with you yet again, Tim. Thank you for having me, as always. Uh, yes, continuing uh, rolling out my collection of friends, as Tim so eloquently put it. Uh, yes, Jeremy is one of uh, one of my good old Fox buddies. Uh, we kind of uh, suffered through many a uh, rough show at, <laughs> at Fox, but um, he was kind of the uh, the animation genius. Worked on all most of the animation titles that came through along with uh, the SVP at the time, Arnaldo D'Alfonso. Um, but, uh, you know, always a great guy, always bubbly and upbeat. Um, if Cammy and I were the corner of negative reinforcement, he was the corner of positive reinforcement. Oh, that's good. We have a... The, the <laughs> yeah, see, there's a connection here, yeah. right? <laughs> um, so, it, you know, it's great to have Jeremy here. I'm excited. You guys are going to really enjoy talking with him. Um, so, Jeremy, welcome. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got where you are and... Um, Give us a little bit of backstory of, uh, of Jeremy. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Real delight, real treat. Um, so, yeah, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. Um, got my start. It's funny. I've heard this story a lot of times of the didn't know what to do, came out of school, uh, kind of was floundering. I actually decided I wanted to get into trailers, which is that, you know, that that is kind of a, a rarity. Uh, applied to a couple of places, got an internship for a couple of weeks. They knew someone at Disney and I got a job there in their home entertainment division. Uh, and I worked there for six years before going over to 20th Century Fox uh, in their home entertainment division, worked there for six years. And then I transitioned over to their theatrical group. And that's when I met Keith and Cammy and all in Thomas and all sorts of great people. <laughs> um, and then I worked there for uh, another six years before uh, Disney decided to buy the studio and uh, spend some time at Disney. And, uh, and here I am. So you actually did the transition with the team, Fox to Disney, where others that we've talked to didn't, well, yeah. didn't go through the transition. And I was a bit in an unusual position because uh, because of my animation background, I, they actually kind of took me off of the Fox team and put me into the Disney team um, just because my background and my skills kind of were more. When you say your uh, animation background, tell, tell us what that means specifically, but you've specialized in marketing animated films. Correct. And it's interesting because I didn't get into it for that. And, and especially in my days in home entertainment, I worked on a little bit of everything. Um, but yeah, when I came over to theatrical, it was right when Fox had uh, closed the DreamWorks animation distribution deal. And so they kind of, I think, needed needed someone, needed some a little more help. And so I kind of started there with the crudes. Um, and Fox, of course, had their own animation studio with Blue Sky. Uh, so started working on those as well. Ice Age, Rio, and... Um, yeah, you know, you just kind of get an affinity for something, you get a comfort level, and um, next thing you know, that's what you're doing. Um, I, you know, it's funny, it, people like to see it as animation, but I, I love comedy, so, and and most of the times when you're trying to sell an animated movie, the best way to do it is comedy, you know, funny is money, so, uh, so yeah, I think that was really my... Uh, it, was, it was always, uh, it was always, especially when we were working on Deadpool, it was always funny because Arnaldo's office, who was the treat credit exec on that movie, would have like f bombs coming out of his office, <laughs> and then Jeremy would have some sort of kitty joke coming out of his office. So it was just like you know, it was just hilarious that sort of dynamic f bombs and like, fart jokes. Is that what the whole yeah, department was? Exactly. <laughs> yes. Basically, I mean, you could get you could get all kinds of noises when you come to our little corner. <laughs> well, you'd be surprised what the overlap is. So yes, yeah, right. <laughs> Oh, that's really great. Um, you know, some of that transition that you've experienced, was it was it exciting to jump into Disney animated? I mean, that's kind of like like the pinnacle of of the experience, right? Oh, yeah. And that's the thing is, you know, during all my time at Fox, I mean, we kind of we kind of looked to Disney. They were kind of, you know, put on a pedestal as kind of what you aim for and what you try and achieve. And so, yeah, it was a bit surreal when I first started uh, working there um, just to be like, you know, 
part of it. Um, but, you know, once you start doing it, you start to see a lot of similarities, you know, there's not that many differences. And, you know, if anything, and I don't know if this, I, you know, I, I did hear the your interview with Cami, And so I know that you guys talked about this. But, you know, one of the things about working at Fox was, um, you know, we didn't have any sort of uh, brand equity uh, that we could rely on, you know, so it required us to work a lot harder and really kind of, you know, you know, kind of, you know, hone our teeth, if you will, uh, working on those things. So that was, that was part of the fun is like when, when I worked on the animated movies for DreamWorks and Fox, there were no slam dunks. So you really had to work hard. So. Yeah, sure. I'd, I'd be curious, Jeremy, um, because what I've heard from a lot of people who've made the transition over to Disney Mm -hmm. is the cultural differences. Um, and it's funny because, you know, when we were at Fox, the mantra was always, we're an entrepreneurial company, which I always like, kind of looked at that as like, well, we just do things on the cheap. Like if it requires four people, we're just going to do it with half a person. <laughs> but from just sort of what I've talked to some people and even some of the people that have gone to the streamers, it seems that that was really the case that we, as a department, everyone kind of always worked together. Like, especially in our department with creative, we oversaw all basically every single piece of creative that went out the door had to go through our department before it went and any saw anyone in the public saw it. And I'm curious if, because what I get a sense from what the way Disney operates is very much everyone's in their little silos, the little silo. <clears throat> and there isn't a lot of back and forth. I mean, you have your, I'm, I know that strategy has definitely has more of a control over where things go at Disney. Whereas Fox, it was sort of like, ready, fire, aim, basically. So uh, I'd be curious to see that, you know, what your initial impressions were. Is is it a totally different culture or are there definitely similarities? <laughs> um, I mean, there's some similarities, but it is different. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely much more siloed. Um, I mean, there's some logistical differences. They, you know, they split their, their AV creative and their print creative up. They're kind of two different departments. Uh, mm. They don't have as much kind of communication <clears throat> whereas at fox it was all one group you know and yeah. a lot of times one you know when you had a creative lead that person was overseeing both and which was nice because it, you know it, it made sure that you could have kind of a synergy and that every consistency consistency and spoke to each yeah. other you didn't have one person doing something that kind of didn't kind of jive with with the rest of the campaign um but yeah i think you know it's it's that kind of bunker mentality, you know, like when you're, you know, when you're in it, it's like your foxhole. Yeah. The doors were always open. We were all always kind of congregating in each other's offices, uh, sharing things to each other, just like getting thoughts. And um, yeah, I think, you know, at Disney, there's, there's definitely a lot less of that. Um, hmm. And again, it's just, it's just, uh, sorry, it's just, uh, you know, I think expectations and pressure and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I just think there's a little less at Disney because at the end of the day, worst case scenario, you can kind of lean on your, your, your branding, of, you know, your Marvel or Star Wars or Pixar, and, you know, it's going to help you. Do you think that, or did you see any trends that were changing in animation over time? Because the transition obviously were at least Disney had some competition in the work that you were doing at Fox, when the two companies merged, did you feel a sense of a change of, oh, this is gonna change the animation production, I don't know, worldwide or something like that, or how people make certain decisions to uh, green light animated films. Did you get a sense of a trend that was changing once that merger took place? Not really, actually. I honestly, I, I saw it more as kind of a content move. Um, I think, you know, it was around the time that, or it was actually before Disney had launched Disney Plus, um, but they were obviously gearing up for launching this big streaming service and, you know, wanted to make sure they had a lot of content and um, they didn't have the rights to DreamWorks Animation. You know, that um, Jeffrey ended up selling the company to Comcast, so that's now mm. universal. Um but, but Blue Sky. So I think that was part of it is being able to have all those Blue Sky films. And there's some great franchises there with Ice Age and, and Rio and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, it is a shame, you know, uh, there was the report not too long ago that they decided to shut down Blue Sky Studios. And, and, uh, and they actually, I was working on one of their movies that was pretty far along uh, called Nimona. It was based on the graphic novel. And it was really gonna be pushing some thematic boundaries um, especially like in the LGBTQ plus kind of uh, area. And I was excited about it. Um, but 
uh, yeah, they they kind of had positioned Blue Sky as being the studio that could do things that Pixar and Walt Disney Animation couldn't, you know what I mean? Tackle certain subjects and tones and genres that maybe were you know not as comfortable for them in some of their other family-friendly uh, areas. So Yeah, we actually covered the Blue Sky yeah. a moment here and and had questions about just like the monopolization of content that Disney was then basically editing down, you know, the, the, how that was going to affect animation. So there really is kind of a trend difference, just the ability to have blue sky under their umbrella and cancel it changes some of the landscape out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, uh, yeah, it's a shame. I think, you know, we all agree competition breeds innovation and creativity. And when there's less people out there, um, you know, it allows you to kind of, you know, you can make more sequels, you can kind of ride IP, you know, without feeling that pressure to like come up with some new grand idea. So, uh, yeah. Um, all right. So here, here's kind of the question of the, of the moment, let's say, because, uh, now I have two experts that have worked in major <laughs> studios, like just like Fox and Disney are not, are there known names everywhere? So Kudos to you guys. Your parents should be proud of you. You guys got real jobs at real studios at one point. Um, <laughs> but the between the visibility that the two of you have on how marketing really works in the industry, um, why people uh, make certain decisions to reach certain markets, um, the ability to do certain plays or honestly to retell a story in marketing so that it does kind of get people into the seats regardless of what the story really was in the in the actual film. Uh, we know that that's part of the game, especially Jeremy, if you were in trailers, you know, that's totally the game <laughs> retelling the story. Um, the, it feels like the shift going in the last year, two years, whatever, whatever it's been now of Disney launching Disney Plus. We had Netscape on the landscape. We have Amazon Plus. I mean, uh, Amazon Prime um, do, playing their game, that this content move, as you said earlier, Jeremy, the content move really has become the new game, like get as much content as possible out there. That has to be um, a different challenge for every marketing person, right? To say, yeah. oh, I'm now marketing content instead of marketing the overall brand or overall channels, or overall distribution channels. Um, being that that's major, I don't know what the question is yet, but like this idea of like the, the oh, that being that that's an overall Where marketing going shift. With this? I know, right? Yeah, I just want to. I'm just <laughs> processing. I know, yeah. like there's something really happening here, and it's creating new problems. It's creating new problems for the consumer. Where do I go? How do I, you know, where do I find this stupid thing? Yeah, but also just the idea of like the content makers are being lost in a crowd of content push that's all over the place. So the creators are also like missing out on their big moments. The idea of the blockbuster going away is insane. Like it's absolutely different. Absolutely. I was actually just talking to someone who was working on a show for, uh, for a network um, and, and was kind of bemoaning the fact that they didn't feel like they were getting some of the um, kind of maybe support or kind of push that, they, you know, thought they would maybe get. And I, I was saying, I, I think it's because, you know, it's almost like in our country, not to get political, but it's like, there's almost no middle class anymore. You know, it's like, I really feel like things are split into two very distinct tiers. And it's like, there's the, the, the tent pole, there's the, the big thing. And then everything else is content. And, and that line is really, um, is really dividing things and between the haves and the have nots. And I think it's frustrating for the people who are working on what is now just considered content or worst case scenario filler. Um, and I think that's a big part of it is it's like, it's, it's hard, you know, and, and even the big, you know, Disney, which, you know, uh, you know, is, is built a great kind of history of having good relationships and stuff like that. Like most studios, I think the, even they are starting to decide like, okay, well this, this is a project and a, and a filmmaker that we really need to support and, and kind of, you know, whatever, flatter or whatever it is versus this is someone that's providing content and maybe we don't need to kind of put as much idea and manpower behind. I, I love that idea of that division, but 
what a challenge. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would, I would say, you know, I, I <laughs> it's funny because everyone keeps saying content and I go back to Scorsese's article that he wrote not too long ago about the bemoaning the loss of the art of cinema. And one of his biggest critiques was that we just talk, everything's just content now. There's no more films. There's no TV shows. It's just content. Yeah. And I think that's part of the problem is that we've sort of lost the sort of distinction of what's what. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Disney setting up that whole new media and entertainment distribution branch or whatever it is, that's Kareem Daniels' new division. <laughs> it seems like, because now a lot of the titles at Disney are shifting, like Assad's now the head of Disney content studios or my head of marketing for Disney content studios. I mean, what? Yeah. Like it used to be Disney studios, which meant film studio, but now it's like, it's like it's splitting and it's almost like they're pulling the, the sort of distribution and the content are becoming separate. When before they all sort of lived under one umbrella, you had sort of, you know, the head of distribution and you had the head of marketing all reporting into the studio head. Mm -hmm. And now at Disney in particular, you have, the Allens, basically, and then they have Assad, but now they lost their distribution Allen. head. One Allen, too. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, and he lost his distribution head, their distribution head, and now he's over reporting to Kareem's group. Yeah. So, and now it's sort of like this idea, like, well, we need to figure out where the content's going to live first. And that's what Kareem's job is, to figure out what distribution channel is going to, which, which direction it's going to go in. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think your point is very well taken about sort of the, the split sort of not being too political, but it is sort of, there's a split and there's, I, there's the, definitely a movie that is sort of a, like a fast and furious nine. That's going to be a big hit. It's going to be a movie that's probably going to make money, mm -hmm. but then everything else gets lost. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's also this sort of coastal uh, crowd that likes to make all these movies. That's really just for them. And that's what we saw with the Oscars. It was basically all these movies that they just wanted to make. Yeah. And there's a chunk of the audience that's getting lost and everyone's just running and screaming and trying to get as much content out as possible, yeah. but a lot of it's getting lost. And I would also say, you know, I agree a lot with Kimmy when she brought this up, when we had her on, and I'm sure you would probably agree with this a little bit, even though you don't have a ton of experience with a streamer yet. Um, it's sort of this idea that there's no art to marketing anymore. It's just literally like, pushing out the same stuff over and over again, using the same tools, the same tricks. And I would actually say that we can't really tell a different story than what the movie's telling anymore because the audience can smell, smell that from a mile away. Oh yes. Yeah. So I mean, when I, when we were at Fox, Tony Sella was genius at this. Yeah. He would take a movie that was probably not the greatest story yeah. and he would find a compelling narrative and make the trailer to tell that story, which he knew would probably drag people into the theater, even though the story of the movie yeah. was completely different. A case in point would be Marley and me. We <laughs> told that story basically as a dog, they get a dog for Christmas and we had a shot of the puppy with the bow and la, 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 and then the dog dies, but we yeah. totally left that out of all the materials. Yeah. And even though it was a book, no one really caught onto it until they caught onto it. Yeah. And you know, that's an out from you don't really see anymore. But um, I would say that that's sort of one of the things that I also bemoan is like marketing as sort of this beautiful art form and putting together an entire strategic campaign around three trailers, TV spots, digital. It just seems to be all like me or slimming down to like a trailer, get it on the, the streaming service with its tile and go next. Keith, well, I, I love what you guys are the challenge because that's what, how it feels as a consumer too. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, well, so I, two things. So one is to your point about what we used to be able to do versus now, part of that I think was just impacted by uh, the kind of the rotten tomatoes of it all mm. and, and social media. It's like yeah. people didn't used to be able to communicate as quickly and with as much kind of, you know, uh, you know, whatever kind of awareness that they used to. And now it's like, yeah, you used to literally have till Friday night before anyone could tell anyone anything about the movie mm -hmm. that they yep. had seen. And now it's like all that can happen before. And that that is partly what has affected our ability to kind of, you know, hide or or cheat or whatever we want to do. But yeah. the bigger thing I want to say is, and um, and you you touched on it with the when you're talking about the art of it, um, 
But when you're talking about all these conversations about what's happening with the studios and their new you know, distribution stuff, the word creative is like not part of it. Um, and that's kind of like, that's my thing. Like if I'm going to bring something to this, to this, you know, conversation in this series, it's like, I, I really am about the creative and that's what inspires me. That's what motivates me. It's, it's not, you know, it's not paychecks. It's not, you know, saying you work for some fancy studio. I've always been about the creative and the creative challenges. And I think that's even more so kind of out the door. Um, and, um, yeah, yeah it's, it's a shame because, you know, yeah, it's like when you're seeing things as just a product and and part of a subscription package, um, it just becomes less of a priority. Um, so, yeah, the, the, from a consumer point of view, it feels very much that same way, too. Like, like it's become such a commodity that's being forced onto people. And again, like uh, Jeremy, this idea of the haves and have nots, it's it's fascinating once you said that to process through of you really do get certain movie stars or filmmakers that are in the haves category. And it's clearly there's the selected and we're going to cater to them. And we found that. And everyone else is, you know, matches almost like an influencer mentality of like, yeah, we just need stuff. Just, just go make me a commodity. I just need more filler. And as a consumer, that's where it's hard to navigate. You're almost like, oh, I have to go to some predetermined channel because that's the only information I've received. Um, in marketing is the stuff where they told me to go watch. Um, I can't really, even though the content exists, I don't know what I'm looking at. I have to spend hours of investing into some kind of weird menu screen to figure out what else is out there that I'd be interested in seeing. Yeah. Um, and that almost like it's hurting the creative makers, creative makers, the original content makers, but also the creative makers in the marketing field um, where there are people that have, have an amazing talent in telling these stories and, they're being commoditized as well. Wow, that's yeah, that's pretty interesting. I almost wonder where where this trend takes us. So, are the studios going to invest in this further, or when does this even break and and fall apart and something has to shift? Well, it's interesting because you know I've referenced uh, Peggy Newton before on this podcast, and I'm going to reference her again um, because she wrote a really great column in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, it was a little bit about Biden's speech again, not to get too political, but the sort of the there were thrusts of it was that she feels, and she's older, she's in her seventies. She's saying she thinks that the pandemic has shifted a lot of what the younger generation, like the 20 year old and 30 year olds, what they are going to value moving forward and whether or not it's going to be the way, you know, cause you know, our generation journey was raised a lot. I mean, you go to college, you get a job, you make all the money, buy a house, yada, yada, yada. This generation, the previous generation, they've been through, financial crisis, now pandemic, uh, unrest over the summer. And it's just her, her, she was basically saying that we don't know where this is going to end up. Like, we don't know what the shift and the shift could go back to, I want to do more communal things. I want to do things. I want to slow the pace of life down a little bit. And that could involve sort of not getting so bombarded by just so much content. It could be an aspect of going back to a theater on a Friday night and seeing a movie and turning off your phone and just disconnecting from the world and just sort of embracing the idea of not being just so in the moment every single time, you know, just yeah. being dodged, you know, being en engulfed with everything that's happening in the world and just kind of just taking a step back and enjoying sort of the slow pace, life, which I think uh, we've basically lost because of these little devices. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I think she was basically saying, we don't know what's going to happen now. We, we don't know if there's been a so total shift based on what they've seen over the last 10 to 15 years sure. with, as I said, the financial crisis and now the pandemic. So I, maybe that means things will go sort of regress, not regress, probably the wrong word, but go back to the way things were when we were sort of at, you know, during the height of the Fox crazy, when we were finishing a hundred TV spots for a campaign yeah. and rushing the tape across the street. So we get a spot on American Idol. Um, yeah. So, you know, and maybe the craft and the artmanship of sort of marketing and the overall campaign may come back. I don't know. But it, Keith, I almost feel like you're saying that we 
the the studios are going to dumb us down in a way. Like right now we have a lot of transparency and the perceived idea of a lot of choice and the there's no threshold to make content um, and everybody's equal, right? That's kind of some of that big gigantic content play. That's some of the issue of there's no filters also mm-hmm. to an idea of like people are going to want to just veg out. They're going to want to escape. And so therefore there's going to be like a new, like separation or even a greater separation to. Yeah. I don't want to say veg out, but I mean, maybe I I just think, I mean, the Oscars articulated this perfectly. It's just these movies that nobody saw. There's tell stories that are depressing as hell Yeah, and nobody wants that. I mean, it's just, it's just not, it just, it isn't something that is going to stir anything inside you. I mean, and storytelling is a, across all of human history, the one thing that really sort of pulls us all together. And Hollywood has positioned itself as the ultimate storyteller. Mm -hmm. And we are the magic of movie making. And this is the beauty of storytelling and and on one of its most beautiful forms. And they're failing at that abysmally because they're making all these depressing ass movies. And what I'm saying is, it might go back to the idea, especially as it starts to get the studio and, you know, the same five people that have been running studios for the last 20 years, finally take us, take a back seat and somebody else gets in the driver's seat. Maybe things will shift and it'll be more of a slower paced, you know, type. Like I think of that scene in the holiday when um, the writer character gets up when he's receiving his award from the WGA. And I think I've referenced this before. Yeah. He gets up and he says, when I started in this industry, we weren't reporting box office like it was baseball scores. So maybe the idea is we go back and sort of maybe the theatrical side of things starts to slow down a little bit. We focus more on the quality and then try to figure out a way because there's just so much out there now that you really need to bombard every single platform with all this new stuff because at a certain point, the quality is going to start to suffer. I look at Jeremy smile. He wants to say something. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, I, I would love that. Um, and and the kind of, you know, uh, optimist in me hopes for that. But I do think, you know, again, you know, coming back to the original point about the, the, the two tiers and stuff like that, I think it ultimately will just become a decision of, of, of money and where, yeah. where studios decide to allocate it. And that's where the decisions are going to be. They're just going to be like, oh, well, um, this is, you know, this is something that we can just maybe now uh, allocate less money to um, versus, you know, versus the thing that we're going to put all of our, our kind of. You mean like as an investment, they're basically going to cut it short or reallocate. Oh, I just mean like, yeah, I just mean marketing support, uh, you know, uh, media. Um, yeah. I just think that, uh, uh, it's just, yeah, it's just going to get further kind of split in that, in that sense. What do you think of Keith's idea of like, um, where a Disney and their restructuring is actually creating almost a marketing agency mm-hmm. separate from the distribution channels or uh, content, um, I don't know, specific Creators. idea. So they won't necessarily have like an animation group doing something, but there's almost like an overall agency and maybe someone focusing on the, the, the global je- uh, Disney brand instead of all these separate silos. Um, do you think that would create more opportunity if something like that happened? Possibly. I mean, I actually see, you know, there's a positive to me in, you know, it used to be, and I think there's still definitely some people in the studio with that old mindset of like, uh, theatrical is better than TV. And so, and, and stream, you know, people I think are still thinking of, of shows and content for streamers as being TV. And so I did quotation marks for the pod. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, you know, that's not true. We know that we know that the, the writing and the production and television and series has in a lot of ways surpassed what's available theatrically. Um, but they still think that way. So I think there's part of it is they felt like, oh, we're going to bring the TV up to the pedigree and level and expertise that we have in theatrical. But I will say, I think there is something like there is some some great minds creatively that have been working in, say, theatrical marketing. And to be able to have some of those minds now participating in, uh, you know, in kind of more TV, TV oriented content, I think is great. And I do like... 
listen, I'm all about synergy. As we're saying, when I was at Fox, I loved, I loved that people were talking and stuff like that. And so before this, yeah, it's like you had an animated movie and an animated series and you had two different groups and they weren't talking, you know, or a Marvel movie and a Marvel series, you had two different groups and they weren't talking. So the idea of them putting them all under the same kind of roof, I think that's probably good. I think it's probably good for whenever you have something and you're trying to push uh, whether it's a brand or a vibe or a theme or a tone or anything like that, I think bringing people together. And so, yeah, it could, you know, once that group kind of expands, I think there could be opportunities there. Um, you know, the, the, the kind of the limited number of gatekeepers that were in charge of, of you know, deciding theatrical campaigns, uh, I think is going to naturally have to expand just because the, the quantity is going up so much. I love that insight because it's um, probably the first time it's uh, hit me so clear is that possibly Disney's big reorg is something about just reshuffling the intellectual furniture of the people to say, Hey, by the way, television and theatrical are not, so, you know, television isn't subservient to theatrical in order to get people to think differently. We have to change the decision makers and the structure of decision-making so that we no longer have that silo based thinking and we can put platform agnostic marketing in place. It Absolutely. does create a totally different problem, right? That they're not going to tell a different story in theatrical than OTT. I mean, they might or might not, but when you put everyone in the same bucket, you're going to get kind of a churn and burn. That's what we've been pointing to. Yeah. But the thought of like, well, how else are we going to get people to think differently? Because this residual of like one is under the other doesn't naturally work itself out until you point to something that's different. Yeah, that's, yeah, you get a pro and a con for, for that whole change, don't you? Yeah. And there was a lot of, I think there were a lot of sacrifices that were made to, yeah, the theatrical marketing kind of approach and stuff like that. While all these, you know, these studios were trying to, you know, get, push people to their streamers. And so they wanted them like not to seem as a, as a demotion, like, oh, this movie that's also in theaters is, is, you know, that's in theaters is also on the streamer and that's not a negative. Um, And so, I think, yeah, they had to kind of sacrifice some of the techniques that they would use to prop up a movie theatrically in order to get people to feel comfortable, like, oh, I could see it here, it here, and I'm going to enjoy it either way. But yeah, once, you know, once all the theaters open up and they need to start pushing that and they start looking at that box office again, it's going to be very interesting because a lot of those people who have that theatrical temple kind of mentality are not in place to do that anymore. And they've been replaced with, you know, people that are data driven and, and you know, and research <laughs> that and and yeah, they'll see, you know, when they're not, when they're not seeing a hundred million dollar weekend, um, it might uh, change things. We've know? been calling it the end of the blockbuster. And I think you're right. Yeah. Like the, the long-term change that's going to take place. But yeah. I also love it that the, I don't love that it's into the blockbuster, but the blockbuster was, you know, in my lifetime was created. I mean, it started mm-hmm. with Jaws in the, in the seventies, Star Wars and, and that, so on. So there wasn't hundred million dollar films, now billion dollar films. Right. that were taking place. And the thought that there is a transition from the blockbuster to something else, that's that's cool. We're gonna, in yeah. 10 years, we're gonna name it because you always look backwards and then you can call it something else. Yeah. Um, so there is an interesting new uh, movement taking place and we're all victims and um, recipients of this great um, um, movement well, taking place. But it here's one more thing. Here's another career. thing. Another thing I would say, and I think Jeremy's right, it's interesting that, you know, used to be TV was kind of sort of subservient to theatrical. And but I think what you're going to start to see is that TV is going to be the more expanded place to tell a story, whereas the film side, the theatrical release is going to be the more huge, epic see it on a big screen type style of storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you see a little bit of that with Marvel starting to, with their series. You can tell that they're going to, whatever they're doing in the series is going to play off in the movies. And I think the idea that the stories are sort of tied together is definitely a smart way to play it in terms of tying together what the stories you can tell on TV versus the stories you can tell on theatrical. Because there used to be a wide disparity between what you could do in TV and what you could do theatrically. But now that is totally yeah, gone be, more or less. It'll be interesting to see because like there was just even a quote recently from James Gunn, who I guess just finished wrapping, wrapping up Peacemaker, which was a TV show based on his new Suicide Squad movie coming out. And he said, after he finishes Guardians 3, he might not ever, he might just stay in TV because the experience was that much more enjoyable to him. Enriching, yeah. 
So. Yeah. Wow. That what a maybe what a great move for filmmakers because I know the director game like you can make a film or two and then just be lost, never mm-hmm. be called back again. Um, and there's even some great documentaries of, of amazing directors that had a good string of movies and then one film and their whole career is over. The thought there's a long play for people's career. That's, that's very exciting. That's nice. And, and to have some of these longer OTT plays is, is awesome, especially if the marketing departments can make that evolution. So that is a very positive spin on some of these changes. Well, and and it's a longer kind of you know, if you're going to a, a studio or a streamer and saying, I can give you something that's going to give you attention and, and kind of interest in viewers for one or two weeks versus three months, uh, you know, they're going to be like, I want the three months. You know, I, I it's funny, I watched recently, there was that series on HBO, The Undoing, the one with Nicole Kidman and Hugh. And, mm, and, and, and I watched it and I think it was like four parts, but I remember when it was over, I was like, I make you a bet two or three years ago, that's just a movie. And it comes and goes, little fanfare. But it became a mini series event for, for HBO. And that's going to mean more to them and other. If they go to shop somewhere else, they're going to be like, yeah, I made that mini series event, The Undoing, that captured people's attention. And people were talking about it on Twitter and stuff like that for, for you know, you know, months versus like, yeah, I had a movie that came out, went, and no one will ever talk about it again. Yeah, yeah. There is yeah, the, the idea of a long play, a long tail to, to some of the stuff. Yeah. It's so, uh, I mean, uh, the reason we're doing this podcast is to almost bring this stuff up. Cause I think we're all feeling it. Um, I, some people that are listening to us are trying to make career choices or that they can feel the transition. Other people are optimistically looking at, at the, the changes and trying to figure out where they fit into it. So this, mm-hmm. these new rules, these new players and some new structure to get down to what the decision making is going to be like is pretty interesting. Here, there's a, what I would say, just my last point to people who are interested. Yeah, yeah. if you're interested um, in the creative part of it and finding creative challenges, which is, again, that's kind of my approach. I'm less concerned about kind of the optics and the, and the, and the Hollywood of it all. But if, if, if what's, you know, drawing you to this industry is the idea of being challenged and using your brain and coming up with stuff like that, there will always be a need for that. Um, and that's the thing is it's like, you can find a creative challenge in anything you can do. You can find a creative challenge in, you know, organize, you know, organizing your sock drawer, whatever. It's it just, it's like, so, you know, if you're creative, you'll find, you'll find a place to, to use it. And so uh, I feel like there'll, there'll always be a place for that. You could have one trailer for one show, but you're going to get challenges on that. And, and uh, I don't think your moms are going to be as proud of you guys if you're just reorganizing sock drawers for a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, maybe. Mom, um, I went from Disney to sock drawer organizer. <laughs> I put it on my resume. It, you know. Yeah, there you go. You never know. It might pop. <laughs> okay, Keith, you are right. Jeremy is a positive outlooker. Told this is. I told you. <laughs> Now and I want to get say, all your friends together and see how Jeremy fits into this uh, he, mix of friends. He wanted me to say this is the first of a five-part series, so we make sure we oh, get yeah. him back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Jeremy, uh, we I should try to do it. one where we get like everybody who was on the third floor on one Zoom. That would be rowdy. Oh yeah. That'd be yeah fun. Anyway, there's going to be alcohol involved in that one. I'm pretty oh, sure. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> then you'll get some good stories. Yeah. <laughs> I want to uh, I want to pull you guys all to the West Coast. Maybe we can actually do a live event with with you guys. It'd be pretty well, fun. Yeah, nigga, he's already there. I'm the one that's not. I got to get to the West Coast. Yeah, we'll get you out here. <laughs> yeah, you will. Jeremy, thank you so much for being part of Hollywood Breaks. It's awesome to have you. And uh, your smile is contagious. People listening to the podcast don't get to see <laughs> Jeremy's smile, but he really is just. Uh, it was hard to get Jeremy to crack. I was trying to give him some pessimistic ideas here and it wasn't really happening. So nope, not going to have tell you though. He is the, co- he was the corner of positive reinforcement. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yep. That's what he was. Well, thank you guys again for listening to Hollywood breaks. We appreciate you being uh, our listeners, our audience out there. If you love what you hear, please hit the subscribe button here on YouTube or podcast, um, wherever you're listening to it. We'd love it. As Keith likes to point out, give us the good reviews. If you like what you hear, keep on putting five it stars, there, so five stars, know, five stars only. <laughs> That's what we want. Um, Keith, uh, thank you again for pulling in your friends. It's awesome to have Happy uh, to you do and it. your thoughts here of what's happening in Hollywood, getting that breaking insights, what's going on. 
and Jeremy until session number two of five. Part two. (laughs) (laughs) Until the sequel. (laughs) Keep it going. Of course. Talk to you soon.